He is doing so much for me. I love that song. This, this evening, we have an, an opportunity again to gather around the throne of God. And as we have, we've been able to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And I'm looking forward to our discussion uh, tonight as we talk about the church and recognizing whose hands the church is in. You know, I, I noticed when our young people were, were leaving to go to uh, their Bible hour, uh, did you hear the, 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 the uh, hooray from one of the young people? Did you? I heard it. Hooray. You know, when it comes to young people, they're going to tell you like, like it is. And it, you see the innocence from them. And, and actually, when, on the way into the auditorium tonight... Uh, Logan Denson came up to me and he, he asked me, he says, are we having a question, a question and answer tonight? I tell you, I get to see his heart when he gives me those questions and he is so on fire. And I see the, our young people and, and experience the, the, that joy in their questions and that when they see the answers and that, that light that comes on, it's a great reminder for me that we're all striving to continue to grow. And think about, I was actually... This lesson came from the prayer last week when it was, it was at the 8 o'clock service. It was during the opening prayer, and it was mentioned, uh, thanks be to God for our young people. And, and it mentioned concerning uh, the church of tomorrow. And based on our young people, I, I, I believe that the church is in good hands. Amen. And especially today when we had the, uh, the event, uh, our young people uh, serving the, uh, our, our Golden Agers at the banquet. It was fantastic, and I'm very thankful for J.J. and Nia and for what they are doing for this congregation. Amen? Yeah. And being able to see just this blessing, it, it, it definitely got my mind thinking. And I wanted to, to go from a question what does the church of tomorrow look like? Well, the ch I've heard this, and you know, as was said in the prayer, children of the church of tomorrow, but we are seeing that our children are the church of today. We're seeing their actions, we're seeing what they're doing, and it is seriously encouraging all of us. And so you represent the church of today when you've obeyed the gospel, and, and how you take part in the way that you do, you do represent us today. But I'd like to discuss the church is in the hands of specific individuals and, and beginning with God. The church is in God's hands. Uh, Philippians chapter 1 verse 3 through 6, if you'll turn there with me. And, and, and if you'll see, I've got these runners behind. I had the, the picture of the runners and, and uh how they're, they're passing on the baton. It's, it's the representation of a relay race. And, and you know when it comes to our youth, they're, we're passing on the baton. And they're the ones taking up the, the torch. And so I understand the concept. And they're continuing this race. But when it comes to this passing on of the baton, it started with God. And, and I'd like to, to look at Philippians chapter 1. In verse 3 beginning, it says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. And Paul is speaking this to the Philippian congregation. Always in every prayer of mine for you all making my prayer with joy. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart for you all are partakers with me of grace both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. When we, we look at this, we, we've got to see God is he's in control. And we have here Paul who is in prison and he realizes that he is limited in what he's able to do. And, and so he prays night and day. He prays constantly for the church. We understand when we read First and Second Timothy that Paul prays for Timothy because he sees he's got to pass on the baton. 
But see, God had a plan when it came to this that he would hand on his responsibility to Jesus. If you will, look at John chapter 3 and verse 35. When we look at John chapter 3, John 3 is a powerful passage that oftentimes we look at John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's a powerful passage. And I think sometimes because we know it so well, we, we gloss over it. But I love verse 35 and 36. It actually clarifies a little further what it means to believe in Jesus. It, uh, verse 35 says, The Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So what God has done with His power is He has given it to His Son. Notice that in verse 35. The Father loves the Son, has given all things into His hand. You almost see that concept of passing of the baton to His Son. And, and so He has the authority. And, and Jesus alludes to this in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 16 through 18. If you'll turn there with me. Jesus represents this and mess, he, he explains this, that He has this authority that the Father has passed to Him. I'd like to begin in verse 16. Now, the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. You know, this is a powerful concept that 11 are there. We understand that Judas is dead at this time. A lot of things have taken place. Jesus has died on the cross. He is risen. And they see him and you understand why some doubted because they watched him die. Thomas could have been one of those as we saw another account that he said, unless I see the, the, the nail scars in his hands and the piercing in his side, then I will not believe. You see, they struggled with this, but Jesus had a plan. You see, God passed the baton to Jesus, but Jesus when, took that baton and he passed it on to the apostles. Even though they doubted, and I'm thankful for their doubt because I can look at this and say, when I've struggled, I can look to them and see their example. You see, they doubted, but that shows and proves the power of, of the gospel that was proclaimed through the Holy Spirit. We discussed that this morning on the day of Pentecost. It had nothing to do with their doubt. And the very fact that Jesus would have known that they doubted. He still sent them on this commission. Goes to show that God was using these apostles. So Jesus was passing on the baton to them. And we see that in verse 19. The first part of verse 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So with the authority that Jesus had, he then takes that authority and he places it on the apostles' shoulders. As we saw this morning, we, were, we discussed in Acts chapter 1, if you'll turn there with me, that... When Jesus is about to ascend into heaven, the apostles have already been given this commission by Jesus. And, and, and here we see in verse 6, it says, So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority, but you, apostles, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So the church is in God's hand and God decides to place it into his son's hand. And his son decides to place it into his apostles' hand. It's why he called them in the first place. This was not an afterthought. When he was calling his apostles, if you'll recall, he said, 
follow me and I will make you fishers of men. You see, he took fishermen and said, I'm going to make you fishers of men. He had a plan before he ever called them that they would take this message. But it was the Holy Spirit that took them. It was the Holy Spirit that they took as far as the message was concerned. And that they would be the, the, the examples. They would be the witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. If you will turn back to Matthew 28. We didn't finish the context there. It shows that the church is, was in the apostles' hand. But the church then is in the hands of the converted. It's in the hands of the converted. Matthew 28 and verse 19 again. Go therefore, because the reason if you'll notice, there's a comma in the middle of this thought. So I'd like to look at 19 again. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. You see, the commission was not just limited to the apostles. And I think when we look at the church, sometimes we just say, well, it was the apostles. They, they had the information. If you, you think about Acts chapter 2 and verse 41, after they obeyed the gospel, the 3,000 were added to the church in verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and the prayers you see, they had, the apostles had been given this information, but the, those who were converted, they were devoted to their teaching. And from that teaching, we understand that they then would take this very teaching to go into all the world. And in fact, when they were scattered and they went about, who preached? Just the apostles, right? Wait, no, the apostles were the ones that remained in Jerusalem. And as they were scattered, they went about preaching the good news, the word of God. You see, they were the ones that would take the message. And that was what God had in mind. So the church was in good hands. And when you think about this, and, and, and you, you, maybe you've played this, the game, the telephone game. You go, and, and maybe we could take this row, and, and JJ, if you began, and you, made a, uh, you, you said something, some kind of a phrase, and as it made it all the way to the end, would it be the same message? As we, we see that, no, it would not be. You know, we've played a game with paper. You, you start out with a phrase, and then you hand off that phrase to the person next to you. They have to draw the phrase. And then you fold down the words and then they take the drawing and someone has to describe what they're seeing. And then they have to fold down that, that drawing and then they, uh, they have to draw what has been described. And it's hilarious. It's hilarious because it's within 30 seconds you've got to try to draw this chicken scratch. And it's really funny to try to relate that ir original message and it's so important that we recognize that as it was been handed down from God to Jesus and to the apostles and then to the converts, it was not any less important than when God delivered it to Jesus who delivered it to the apostles. You see, the message didn't get watered down because of the power of the Holy Spirit. Because of what the Spirit was giving them. And in fact, when we look at the, the early church and we, we look at the gospel accounts. Have you ever noticed the gospels, for instance? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Was Mark an apostle? Was Luke an apostle? No, they were not. But Matthew and John were. They're the bookends, if you will. But Mark and Luke are converts. They were converts to, they were disciples of the apostles. And, and what's amazing is, through the Holy Spirit, they were able to give these accounts. That's how closely they adhered to the apostles' teaching. And so because we have this, we understand that it all matches up and we see, we know what Jesus taught. And that's how we have this. And it's been handed down from generation to generation to this very moment. How you and I have this gospel message today. And so it was based on the converts that we have the gospel. But you know, if you ever stop to think who 
Well, what, does the, what does the church look like in the future? What will this congregation look like in the future? Who's going to pick up the baton? Well, our young people. Yes, we discussed that. But when you're, when you're speaking to that person at Publix, or if, if you're speaking to someone at, at uh, the Mexican restaurant, do you realize that person you're speaking with, or maybe that stranger that you speak with on the street, they might be a potential elder in the church. They may be a future elder. They may be a future deacon in the church, a, a future preacher, future preacher's wife, future elder's wife, deacon's wife, or Bible class teacher for your own children. We, we have no idea. But when we meet someone, do we think about that person as a future child of God? They might be a child of God. We don't know until we're discussing, right? We may not know. But as we're having those conversations, we have opportunities. Because those converts are the future of this congregation here. And, and, and think about how... Years ago, you're here for the very same reason somebody opened their mouth and spoke to you. Or maybe they spoke to your parents or spoke to your grandparents. I think about the history and I think about a, a gospel preacher that, that came to a little place in South Haleville. And there was a tent that was set up and, and he, uh, he had a, a gospel meeting there. And, and that preacher was also... The, the preacher that, that he baptized, Gus Nichols, he was just going around and he was setting up tent meetings. And, and uh, one night, there was a, a lady that obeyed the gospel. And she was 18 years old and she was my great-great-grandmother. If it wasn't for him coming and preaching that gospel meeting, she wouldn't have obeyed the gospel. And she was the first within our family to become a Christian. And I look at that and I see, wow, look at the physical blessings and spiritual blessings in my family since that's taken place. Now, that doesn't mean that we are all just, that everybody just is Christians. We all have an opportunity and a choice as to what we're going to do, no matter what our family line is. But we can all see what brought us to this very moment, can we not? And have you ever just stopped and thanked God? For the blessings that you hear the gospel message. So you're the church of today. And we have to see that the church is in the hands of the converted. But it's in good hands because it's in your hands. The church is in your hands. The church is in my hands. If you will turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 1. It says, Therefore... Having this ministry, by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. With ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. So if you think about this, he's saying we, he's referring to the church that we are the ministers. So you have this ministry, the, 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 the church is in your hands. And you're not proclaiming yourself. You're proclaiming Jesus Christ as Lord. With ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay, to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. So, 
God who handed down the baton to His Son, Jesus, who handed it to the apostles, who handed it to the converts, who handed it to you, we have to realize it's still the power of God that we're upholding. As we said this morning at the 10 o'clock service, and I mentioned that that, that card that was, had several different verses on it that's in my pocket. Romans 1 and verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power unto salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So when we stop and we think, wow, that's a very scary thought that the church is in my hands, we've got to realize it's in good hands because it's not your power that you're proclaiming. It's the power of the gospel. Amen? It's the power of God. And it starts with the person that you meet tomorrow. Or maybe tonight. And it starts with a conversation. And how many people have obeyed the gospel because of that very, the very action. Maybe you're here tonight because someone was willing to open their mouth. And proclaim that gospel message for you. Are you willing to pass on that baton to someone else? It starts with one person. It starts with you making that decision to start with one person. We talked about this morning the power of one. I'm so thankful that God saw fit for us to have that power in the one, Jesus Christ. Maybe you're here tonight and you've recognized that power, but you've not accessed it. You've not made the decision to become a child of God. If you're willing to come and repent of your sins and confess that Jesus is Lord, not you or anything else or anyone else, and be baptized in the name of Jesus for forgiveness of your sins, we understand that simultaneously you'll be added to the church. And you can be a part of this great blessing. But maybe you're a part of it tonight. But you've not been passing on that baton and maybe you need to rededicate your life. You can do that while sitting where you are. Just starting right now. But maybe you've struggled and you've got cares that are affecting you spiritually, physically, emotionally. And you need the prayers of this congregation. Or you need to make your life right with God. Maybe you've brought reproach on the church. And you need to make it right with the church. Whatever your need is, this invitation is for you. Won't you come while together we stand and while we stand.